Good afternoon, I'm Kristen Spindler, Director of Incubator CTX and faculty member at Concordia University, Texas. I'd like to welcome everyone today to our ongoing Incubator Speaker Series. And today's speaker is Gay Gaddis. Gay Gaddis shoots rattlesnakes when she's not in the office. She is a past CEO of the year, awarded by Austin Business Journal. She's built her marketing company, T3, AKA the Think Tank, into an award-winning advertising agency known for crafting innovative and engaging campaigns, as well as landing the Dell account for the new age of digital marketing back in 1992. I met Gay over two years ago at an ABJ morning mentor session. Gay had just published her book, Cowgirl Power, How to Kick Ass in Business and Life. She was signing books at the time, and we talked about her eventually speaking at Concordia. Who would have known then that we would actually get to do this during the global pandemic? But I thought, what a better time to talk about innovative ways to be a leader in business and life and to thrive when things around us are changing. Today, our format is about 30 minutes of Gay going through her presentation. And we'll also have about another half an hour at the end to have some questions and some good discussions. So uh, for those of you with questions as you're listening, please go ahead and type those in the chat. Um, we've got Stephanie Baker, who's the executive director of Gay Gaddis um, Company, as well as Elizabeth Quintanilla, who is a mentor at Incubator CTX, um, also monitoring the chat. So again, thank you so much for coming today. And Gay, take it away. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's a delight to be with all of you today because there's no topic that I love any more than that of entrepreneurship. It is a, a noble cause and a wonderful lifestyle if it's something that you choose to do along the way. Um, but I wanted to open up a little bit about, we, we discussed my book, and the book is really an entrepreneur story. It's a story of how I grew and started a business from the ground up in Austin, Texas, uh, starting in 1989. And for many of you, you may not realize this, but in 1989, Austin was a very sleepy little town. And I cashed in a $16,000 IRA to start my company. And so that's all outlined in the book, kind of the beginning of all of that, and then the path that it led me on. So here it is, Cowgirl Power, How to Kick Ass in Business and Life. And if you will look to the right on the screen, it's a pretty funny photograph. And that is actually me as a child. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in East Texas, and my parents were from Missouri. They were not native Texans, but I was born in Texas, and they decided that I was going to be a little cowgirl. So they dressed me as a cowgirl quite often, actually, and I laugh when I show this photograph and say that I was not a uh, at Halloween costume in that photograph. That was kind of how I dressed a lot. And I also was riding horses and uh, working cattle with my godfather by the age of six. So I grew up around horses. I've always been uh, around cowboys and cowgirls and have a great regard for many of their ethics and how they have conducted themselves. And so it's kind of the backbone of some of the work I did in the book. The other thing uh, about the book is that um, I really put in there some interesting women and when I started doing some research for the book, I realized when I went to the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, and if any of you have ever been there or plan to go there, it's well worth your while. It's a very beautiful museum and very well done. But uh, the Cowgirl Museum features some pretty interesting women who were very big trailblazers back in their day. Uh, they lived in the late 1800s and competed in rodeos and Wild West shows against men uh, all over the country. And actually, many of them were the very first female international superstars. They performed before kings and queens. And uh, I think we have a photograph of a few of them we might show you in a minute. But they literally were pretty amazing women. And uh, in this photograph, you will see uh, the one on the upper left is a woman named Sonora Carver. And you can see that she is diving on horseback from a tower and she was diving into a very small pool of water. Uh, she was a very amazing woman and performed this stunt for many years. But the fascinating thing is that about a year into performing these stunts, uh, she fell into the water on horseback 
with her eyes wide open and it detached her retinas. She became legally blind that day and didn't tell anyone. She went on performing the stunt for 11 more years uh, blind. So you talk about faith in a horse and faith in yourself to be able to do this and never let the crowd down. Uh, what an amazing woman she was and she lived to be in her 90s and had quite a an incredible career and life. Uh, the woman to the upper right is one that many people have heard of. Her name is Annie Oakley. And Annie is a true entrepreneur story, really, because at the age of six, she realized that her family didn't have enough to eat on the table and she lived in Ohio. So she taught herself how to shoot. She went out and killed enough critters, she would say, to feed the family. And then once she did that, she started selling meat in the local market in the village near their farm. She was so successful with this that she was able to pay off the family farm by the time she was 15. And so what an entrepreneur story there. And then she went on to be probably the most famous woman of her time. She was, a, a like I said, performing before kings and queens. So I, I talk about these historic cowgirls because they were really entrepreneurs as well as just being interesting characters. You know, they, they managed their careers and um, managed their performances and had to be creative and, and reinvent themselves and be competitive. Uh, and again, compete against men until the 1930s when at that point, the men decided they weren't going to compete with the women anymore, and that shut down that male-female competitive uh, programming, which was a bit disappointing, but that's how life went. Um, the other thing in the Cowgirl Museum that I love is a big slide that is um, we created, and it talks about the traits of a cowgirl. Now, think about this. The traits of a cowgirl are passion, clever, independent, creative, innovative, steadfast. And I love these words because they really, if you study them, they really become the words that we all want to live by and that entrepreneurs really kind of use as their authentic, you know, nature of what they're doing and how they're uh, crafting their businesses. So let me give you a little story about my company and when I first started. it. I told you I started the company in 1989. I was broke. I had absolutely no money. We were in a terrible deep recession and uh, Austin was particularly crippled by this recession and all the savings and loans failed. Um, the uh, real estate wasn't worth the dirt it was built on. So here I go off and try to start a little advertising agency when my husband said the last thing we need in Austin right now is another little ad agency trying to compete in a recession. So he challenged me one night and we went out to dinner and we were sitting there and uh, he said, okay, so what are you gonna do to differentiate this little ad agency that you have against your competitors? Not only in Austin, but around the state or maybe even nationally. And if you know what this means, every entrepreneur has to be very focused on how to differentiate your business to succeed. Because if you're just like everybody else, why would someone choose you or your products? So we sat there and I kind of rattled off some different phrases and things around, well, we're going to be the science of advertising. We're going to win awards. We're going to be creative. And he said, stop, stop. No one's going to get that. That's, that's not uh, succinct. It's not powerful. Um, and so we had a glass of wine and he asked me again and he said, can you please tell me, what are you going to say or what are you going to do to differentiate your little company? And again, I tried to be more succinct, but I said, we're going to be, you know, the science of marketing and we were going to do award-winning creative that will get results and we'll take our clients to new levels. And he said, wait, 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 again, you're, you're off base here. So we had another glass of wine and he challenged me again. And at that point, I slammed my hand on the table and I said, you know what? We're going to do kick-ass work for clients who want to kick ass. And he said, that's it. That's your business plan. That's who you are. And that became our mantra. He wrote it down on a napkin uh, at that table that night and we hung it in our lobby at the building and it stood there all the years uh, that I was CEO because it really defined the kind of work we wanted to do. We wanted to do kick-ass work and we wanted to do it for clients who wanted to kick ass. And that's where the magic was because it defined the company we wanted to keep. 
we wanted to work with clients who were willing to try the new, who were willing to take risk, who were willing to walk with us into technology and embrace the what's next. And so that was really the, the key, you know, to defining who we were and how to inform the staff. You have to tell your staff, where are we going? You know, what are we doing? What are we about? And that was a very simple phrase that has stuck all these years. So it's time for you to kick ass and let me explain to you why. Um, here's why, and this is one of the most interesting things about the life of an entrepreneur. It's really about helping others. When you think about it, yes, you may have a product or service that you're passionate about or that you think is really a, a game changer, but when you think about it, you're helping somebody else. Your product, your service has to help others. And just think, of all of the people that possibly you can employ. And right now, during this time where so many people have lost jobs, I'm watching entrepreneurs step up to the table and start creating jobs again for people. And this is a very, very gratifying role as an entrepreneur. And I look back on my career of hiring thousands of people over all those years and knowing that I provided a place that people could practice a craft, do great work, and at the same time provide for their families. And that's a pretty darn good thing to walk away from. Uh, if you think about it as an entrepreneur, it's very gratifying. But it's also, it's about having lots of great options for yourself. Um, Entrepreneurs really get to choose a lot of things that you would like to do. You can make your own decisions. You can decide you want to go into this line of business or pull back on that or maybe expand to a different market uh, or offer new products or services. And that's very exciting because you're in the driver's seat. Now, you may have a board of directors or you may have different uh, entities that have investments in you that will help call those shots. And fortunately for me, I was bootstrapped and I didn't really have to answer to anybody except for our clients. So it was very nice for me to wake up every day and say, well, guess what? You can do what you think is right today and uh, do the things and expand into areas or work on new projects that, that you decide to do. And so that was very fun and very gratifying as an entrepreneur. And I still do that today, uh, by the way, it's, it's part of kind of who I am. And then the last of these three is, it's about building buckets of goodwill for you, your community and your family. Now, as an entrepreneur or a business owner, you get to do a lot of things sometimes for the community. People will call on you and you develop what I call these buckets of goodwill, things you've done and never gotten anything back from or you just do it because it's the right thing to do or because you care or you're involved in something because you feel like you can make a difference. So that's a really, really exciting role uh, as an entrepreneur to be able to do that. So I'm going to give you a few tips from my book. Um, it's been out for two years, but it's evergreen. Uh, this book was written about just real life examples and my advice on how to be more successful and more powerful. And in the back of the book is this thing called the Cowgirl Power Toolkit. And it kind of outlines very succinctly some of the top line uh, advice that I have. So one of the things in the toolkit is to challenge everyone to say, what do you do better than anyone else? And you might say to yourself, well, I'm not sure that I do something really better than anyone else, but you certainly have strengths and you certainly have things that if you tap into that you can really be good at. And those are the things that I ask people to step up and do work hard to be good at something and you can do amazing things by saying, okay, I'm really, really good at that. Um, I use the Myers-Briggs type ind indicator or assessment to help people find their strengths and help them to build on that. So if you haven't, you know, taken an assessment like that or strength finders or something else, it's really good to revisit that. Maybe even if you have taken it at some point, because it will point you in a direction of where your strengths are. And uh, I have a little theory uh, always that if you take your strengths and you match them into a situation, the more that you can eclipse your strength into a situation, the more successful you're going to be. So get on top of that and, and learn that early on. Um, but today, what's exciting is that you can really be an expert on anything. 
I'm doing some research right now on a topic that I don't really know that much about, but I'm learning a lot about it because at my fingertips, I can research, I can find things, I can study things, I can read about it, I can uh, listen into webinars, I can go to classes, you know, in some cases, to really learn about this. And so just think, you can be an expert at anything. It just takes the hard work. You just got to put, get your head into it and roll up your sleeves and do it. But I'll give you a quick example. We had a woman uh, at my company, T3, who uh, had a job description that said nothing about AI, artificial intelligence, but she took it upon herself to just learn it. She was fascinated, curious about it. So she took it upon herself to learn everything she could about AI. And little by little, she became really, really amazingly knowledgeable about it. And at one point, she became our resident expert on it and was brought into client meetings and got opportunities that she would have never gotten had she not just taken that initiative to learn something. So just think about it. Anything you're excited about, you know, even if it's a, you know, learning how to make Greek dishes or, you know, learning how to speak Spanish if you've never done that or just so anything that you're really excited about, you can get into it. You can become an expert at anything. Now, one of the things I talk about to give everybody kind of a, a sense of how are you going to navigate life is that the path to success is not a straight line. And if anyone tells you that you can just rock it into success, they're lying to you because you get setbacks along the way. And I always say that life is a bit like a pinball machine and we get tossed around from side to side every now and then. And it's not just one shot to the top and you win the game. So right now, more than any time, probably we're in one of those pinball moments where the pandemic has changed the way we behave. It's changed opportunities. It's loss of jobs for some people, it's life changes, it's even losing people to death or to very serious illness. And so those are the things that knock us around and keep us from moving straight ahead with our plans. And we're creatures who like to plan ahead and say, okay, we're going to do this and this and this, and then we'll get from point A to B. But we're getting tossed around right now. And it's, it's uncomfortable sometimes. But what I have learned over and over and over through my life, is that when life threw me one of these curveballs, many times when I got back on track, I was smarter, more knowledgeable, more grateful, more insightful than I would have been had I been just marching ahead with my own plans. And sometimes these mid-course corrections allow us to reset expectations and we really come out of it stronger, better and maybe more focused than we would have been had we not had one of these setbacks that they're not pleasant at the time and they hurt and they're painful and sometimes they're really downers but just think of it as an opportunity when we get back on track or when you reset that things will really be better than they would have been had you just marched along your merry little way. Now I have another thing that I love. Um, when I started my business in 1989 I went to visit my mother-in-law and uh, I was sitting at the breakfast table with her and I said, you know what? I feel like I eat risk for breakfast every day. I'm in so much risk right now trying to make this company work and please clients and get things off the ground. And it's tough. You know, I'm going, it's, it's exciting, but it's really scary and it's tough. And as an entrepreneur, we do eat risk for breakfast. It's a risky career. It's a risky lifestyle. But for those of us who enjoy the upside of it, the risk can be very much worth it. So she, as I was leaving her house that day, she walked me through her living room and showed me something that I'd never noticed before. And it was a little box. And on the box, it said, everything is sweetened by risk. It was a little enamel box. And I picked it up and I said, wow, this sure is true. And so she handed me the box and said, I want you to have this. It sat on my desk and still does to this very day. Uh, and I really take it to heart because everything is sweetened by risk. When we don't take the risk, we miss out on the sweet things in life. So another thing that I really like to talk about, and you've probably heard this, but it is so true, is to listen to your gut. Always, always count on that inner compass that you have called your gut because nine times out of 10, it will be right. And some of the biggest mistakes I have made in my career and in my life is when I didn't listen to my gut. 
I hired someone who looked good on paper, who sounded good, but somehow they, I knew in my gut they weren't a fit. I hired them anyway and then ended up regretting it later. So always think about when you're making a decision or when you're trying something new, just listen to your gut because 99% of the time it's going to be right. Um, one of the things that I did, uh, fortunately, was being in Austin, we took advantage of an interesting dynamic that was happening, and uh, this was mentioned in my introduction, but in 1992, we started working with what at the time was a very small company called Dell, Dell Computer Corporation, and my company, T3, was a very small company, and so here we went down this path with a tiger by the tail, and Dell and they were cowboys out there. I mean, they'd say, let's just get 80% of it right and we'll not worry about the 20% rest of it. But what happened is that I was in a meeting in 1994 with Michael Dell and Michael came in the meeting and said, guess what? We're gonna start selling on the internet because it perfectly fits our direct model. Now, what a gift this was to my little company because from that moment on, we had a paying client who was working with us to experiment on all things internet. And so it became our absolute quiver, you know, and our arrows because we were some of the very first marketing successful campaigns in the country and internationally even using email marketing targeting, using metrics that we developed around that, building websites, building web pages, and even doing an online catalog. Uh, we did printed catalogs too for Dell, but we did these online catalogs and we learned so much and the analytics around it was so robust. So, you know, it was a great, great opportunity for us. And we had a 16 year relationship with them. Uh, it did end one day. Uh, it was kind of a sad parting because they wanted me to sell the company to an agency that they had hired and I wouldn't do it. So we, I lost um, $70 million worth of business one day. And you talk about getting kicked in the ass. I mean, that was a horrible experience. Uh, but we survived it. And we survived without borrowing any money. And my team surrounded me and we went out and fought and fought for new business. And that's what you have to do as an entrepreneur. When you lose business, you've got to replace it or make mid-course corrections. Because if you don't, you're out of business, basically. Um, so we worked very, very hard. And because, though, we had this wonderful ability to market companies online, we got into UPS. We got into Chase Bank. We got into Marriott Corporate because all of a sudden these big companies were starting to shift some of their dollars from traditional advertising, meaning television, radio, print, into online vehicles. And there we were ready to take that business. So it was an amazing journey to get there, but um, it was a pretty, pretty wild ride. I'll tell you, that was a tough time in my life, but it worked out for the best really because we diversified our portfolio of companies we worked with in a much better way. And you always want diversity in the clients or customer base that you serve. Um, another thing I always say is to everyone, I don't care if you're working for somebody, a student, um, or if you're an intern, or you're actually the entrepreneur, you've got to understand the money. You've got to understand the inner workings of a company, how it makes a bottom line profit. The more you insert yourself in helping to create that bottom line profit, the more valuable you become. You have better negotiating power. You have better understanding of the business. You have better flexibility. And so the quicker you can understand how the money works in any organization, the, actually the more powerful you become. And so I say, take the CFO to lunch, take the accounting team to lunch, take you know whoever's running the accounts or whoever's really in charge of sales and get your head around how money is made in the company. And you become a big part of that and Basically, you can write your ticket. I, have, I can tell you stories of how it worked for me and how it gave me so much more negotiating power uh, through the years and really much more credibility in every organization that I worked in. Um, one of the things I always like to tell people, and you, some of you are students may not be down this path yet, but uh, certainly at some point you may be, and that is don't separate work from family. 
I see right now an interesting time where a lot of people are working from home and their kids are running in and out of the room. And a few minutes ago, you may have heard my dogs barking because they're part of my family. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're all kind of at home and we're, we're having to deal with our families a little more. But in a typical work environment or work situation, a lot of people will separate what goes on at the office from what's going on with their families. We always brought our children into what was going on at the office and what was happening in our business because we wanted them to start understanding how business worked for one thing and how companies worked and how employee relations worked and all those things. But we also wanted them to understand how we were making a living and how they were all a part of this with us. And we believe now that all three of our children took entrepreneurial paths. And it's been amazing for us to watch that. So think about this, if you're, you know, your significant other, um, your partner, your children, your uh, parents, bring them into what's going on. Bring them in the conversation and you'll be surprised how much it makes you closer and everyone has a better understanding of each other. Now, one of the things that I did many years ago that's really one of the things I am most proud of is I started a program called T3 and Under. And it was a grand experiment almost 28 years ago where I allowed moms and dads to bring their babies to the office. And this was a wild idea because no one would ever had is it doing anything like this? Uh, but we did it. And uh, true to myself, I've always been a cowgirl. I gave every one of those children uh, a little pair of red cowboy boots like I was wearing as a child and uh, gave our friends and clients those cowboy boots too, and I, or cowgirl boots. And uh, it was just part of our trademark. But we had had over a hundred babies come through this program where moms and dads would bring the babies to the office. We would all help take care of them. And then when they were ready to go to daycare or to a nanny or to some other caregiver, it was a easier transition for those parents. And so the picture on the right is one that really almost still brings a tear to my eye. My first two T3 and under babies um, were uh, a grand experiment and uh, it was successful. So we continued the program. Fast forward, uh, 20 years later, and these two interns that I'm pictured with here at T3 uh, were our first two T3 and under babies. And I don't pick the interns, uh, and so I was totally surprised when Davis and Haley walked in with that class of interns that summer, and I cried when I saw them because I said, oh, well, you know, life does go, go full circle. And they were selected on their merit, not just because they had happened to be T3 and under babies, but they were outstanding interns and, and have had outstanding careers after that as well. So it's always good to innovate and entrepreneurs can do this. You know, had I been in another company, I probably couldn't have done it. But again, that's the freedom that an entrepreneur has. I said, I'm going to do this program come hell or high water. And we did it. And it was successful. We were on the Today Show talking about it. ABC Nightline, New York Times, USA Today, and it's become a model for a lot of companies who wanted to do things in a more family friendly way. And again, after this pandemic, I think we're going to be all looking for how are we going to continue to work in a way that includes family and gives us a little bit more flexibility in how we deliver our work product. So the last thing that I really want to talk about because um, um, there is, I will tell you about selling my business, but I want to have plenty of time for Q&A. But one of the things that my father taught me as a child was a very simple phrase. Um, he died when I was 13, but this is something that I remember so well from him. And I built my life around it a lot. And that is meet people where they are. And he was a very big believer that you never let an opportunity pass you by to get to know somebody, no matter where you were or what you were doing. And he would say, Gay, if you are serving soup in the Salvation Army line, I want you to meet the people there. I want you to treat them with dignity and respect and get to know them as human beings. If you are fortunate enough someday to be invited to the White House for a state dinner, I want you to dress appropriately, have the right information about the people you'll be talking to. I want you to have an intelligent conversation and, and really fit in there and meet people right where they are, learn from them. So I always took this to heart and I have met people all my life, everywhere I went, and it has been very, very powerful for me because I keep up with these people and my connections have led me to so many opportunities. So I always look an opportunity to meet somebody. 
uh, there's a really beautiful, beautiful poem that you might want to look up at some point by a rabbi who wrote this many years ago, Lawrence Kusher. And his poem really is around the fact that no one has within themselves all their own puzzle pieces. So when you meet somebody, they may have a piece to your puzzle. And one of the paraphrases from his poem is that everyone carries within themselves at least one and possibly many pieces to someone else's puzzle. So when you meet somebody, it's that aha, you know, they, they add that puzzle piece back to you that you were looking for. And so it's really gratifying to uh, meet people where they are and maintain those relationships and learn from one another. Uh, one last thing I'll tell you is that every entrepreneur has to make a decision at some point. Do you pass this on to your family? Do you sell the business? Do you cash out? Uh, how do you roll your equity? How do you get your money out of this lifetime investment that you've made? Uh, there are many family owned companies that pass on through generations, but those are rare to be honest, and they don't usually last over two generations. Uh, we were fortunate that our oldest son came into the business and was there for now 10 years. Um, and we had a family meeting and decided that perhaps we should just decide if we would like to entertain selling the business. So over a year ago, we did end up selling the business. Uh, it was not, I was not planning on it, but we just really looked around and decided that we had some great offers. The timing was good. And to be honest, I was in the catbird seat. <laughs> I love this slide. It's so funny of the catbird. But you know, timing is everything. The economy was good. We were having a, we had a great year. The business was doing well. And a good friend told me one time, you never want to sell on the downturn. So thank goodness we made the decision to sell when we did at the timing we did, because had we waited six to nine months, it would have not been as profitable. It wouldn't have been as valuable. And we probably couldn't have pulled off the sale. So it was just good timing. And I had already started doing a lot of public speaking. I had done the book. I was, uh, you can see behind me, if some of you can, I'm an artist and I have a very robust art business. I sell paintings all over the world. Uh, so I was already kind of engaged in some things outside of T3. So it wasn't just a complete shock to me to, in that chapter of my life and, and kind of move into my new entrepreneurial efforts of leadership training and uh, speaking and my art. So timing's everything. And if you're an entrepreneur, you're gonna wanna plan for that and figure out what you're gonna do with this thing that you started, that's your baby and it's hard to let go of, but there has to be a natural end to everything in some way. And even if you do pass it on to your family, you're gonna have to back out some because to let that next generation take the reins, they have to have their own way and their own way of doing things, their own power. And you can't just, you know, be there saying, well, that's the way we did it 25 years ago. Let them have their own voice and their own future. So that is kind of at the conclusion of, of all of this. We all have stories to tell. You need to start thinking about what stories you want to tell. I love to tell stories. I can sit here and tell you stories about what's happened to me and my business all afternoon. Uh, but let's do this. It's a little after one. And if there's anyone in the chat who would like to answer a question, I'd be glad to entertain that right now. Great. Okay. So Gay, we have one question. Um, which is how did you decide you were interested in business? Well, that's really interesting because uh, I may have, I'm not sure I told you all this, but my undergraduate degree is in art. And so that's why I'm an artist today. I, I, I was trained to be a fine artist. I went in the advertising business because of that, because this dates me. But when I started in advertising, we had to draw everything. There were no computer layouts or comps or any of those things. So we would draw what we'd show the client. So I could draw and I could write copy. So that's why I got in the advertising business. And one thing led to another. I had different experiences, but one of my most interesting experiences, uh, one of my jobs was that I worked for four guys who'd gotten their MBAs at Harvard and they taught me so much about business. And we did consulting into Fortune 100, 200 companies. So at a very early age, I was walking the halls of Procter & Gamble and Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola uh, and other large companies and watching how teams worked and watching how business worked. And so as a consultancy, I was helping them to, you know, write business strategies and that sort of thing. So I went back to school 
and I started getting my uh, working on my MBA at night. Um, and so one thing led to another and then this recession that hit in the late 80s forced me to think about how to reshape this business that I was working in. I was working for another their advertising agency. So I wrote a business plan and I made a big mistake. I didn't bring along the president of the company with my grand plan. <laughs> so he rejected it. Um, and uh, I just got upset and mad. And sometimes that's what happens with entrepreneurs that one thing snaps and you say, got to do it right now. So I quit. Uh, and in one day, I decided to quit and go out and start my own thing. And here I was in a recession. It wasn't the best time, but there's never the best time. You know, if you've got an idea and you believe in it and you're passionate in it, you can make it work. And so that's when I got, I decided I'm going to go into business for myself because I'd written a business plan. I knew how to run advertising accounts because I'd done it. So I wasn't naive and uh, it would just seem like the timing was right. And I've never regretted it. Not one day. Great. So we have a question um, from Kristen Coulter, who's our VP of Partnerships. She says, love the advice of challenging your team to ask themselves what they do better than everyone else. Can you explain the concept of diversity of thought and how you use this concept to create successful teams? That is a wonderful question because we are all steeped in conversations right now around diversity and inclusion. Um, and there are some very obvious questions around that that we all have to, have to ask ourselves and how diverse are we in our organizations. But I'm going to dial back a little bit to that experience I talked to you about with the Harvard MBAs. One of the things that they were really big believers in was the DIS test, Strength Finders. Strength Finders wasn't even around yet, but Myers-Briggs. And that's when I got my head around my strengths and weaknesses and what my Myers-Briggs type was. And they were big believers in building teams with diverse thinking, diverse personality types. And there's a good business reason to do this. So if everyone is the same, and I will tell you, it's very easy to hire people and surround yourself with people who are very similar to your personality type, because those types get together and they like each other and they agree. But that's the kiss of death. You don't want everyone around you agreeing. So I was determined when I started my own company and I could play it the way I wanted to, that I was going to be very mindful about the teams that we built. And I wanted to put people around me who shored up my weaknesses. And I wanted to continue to build teams with diverse thinking as well as other diversity. Um, and of course, I was always very keen on hiring women because I was a woman on business um, and other diverse groups. But the diversity of thinking is powerful because you have to have people thinking and looking at problems and opportunities with a different lens. And so I encourage people to respect that. And we talked about it all the time. We used to have a big board up in the office with everyone's Myers-Briggs type listed right there for everybody to see. We were very open about it. And we'd say, okay, well, I can understand why maybe this introvert on that team was not very forthcoming about some information because they think internally. They don't think out outwardly like an extrovert does. So I said, let's talk about that. Let's make sure that that person has a voice and we give them time to internalize it and then come back. But I always encourage people on those teams to express themselves. And the way that you don't get beat up on that, um, because some environments don't allow that different thinking to come out. And when that happens, it really stifles innovation and creativity. So we were encouraging of people to we said, you've got to be patient with each other. You've got to listen to the other side of this equation. And when we did, great ideas would come. And so I was very mindful of making sure that my teams were broken up with different personality types. And then you, I built, hopefully, and I've been told this, but a culture of trust and respect. So if someone did have a different opinion, they weren't swatted down and looked down on. They were let's hear them out. Let's listen and let's put all the ideas up there and then we'll come to the best conclusion. But we've got to hear all these different points of view. And one thing personally for me, um, uh, I have a one of my blind spots is, um, to be honest, is I'm not a feeler. I'm, a, I'm a, in the Myers-Briggs, I'm the thinking type. So I'm much more logical about how I deal with people. Um, I would always go to some of my opposites 
in my company, uh, one person in particular who is a complete opposite of me. And I'd say, what is the blind spot here? What am I not doing? And most of the time she would tell me, you forgot to thank so-and-so, or you didn't do this. You didn't think about how that team was going to feel about that uh, if you make that change. And so she taught me how to bring people along better. So we always want to reach out to those opposing types and opposing creative ideas because that's where you really round yourself out. So diversity of thinking and thought is just critical in a successful organization. And I proved it. I did it for all those years. Great. That's really fascinating. Um, we have a question. Where did you get the confidence to embark on this extraordinary journey while risking your IRA? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, what I did say is this. Um, I have a real believing that everything builds on each other. And so as I had progressed, and I didn't just come out of college and start my own business, which I don't say you can't do that. I mean, certainly there's a lot of people who do it. Look at Michael Dell. He didn't even graduate from college and he did it. Uh, so entrepreneurs can pop up at any time in your career. But I had had several jobs and I saw what I was good at. I knew that I could bring people along. I knew I could build teams. And I also knew in my last job before starting T3 that I knew how to run profitable accounts. I knew how the business worked. It's going back to what I said earlier. I knew the money and that's what it takes. You've got to understand exactly how you are going to be competitive and how you're differentiating yourself that I talked about earlier and how you're going to make a profit. Every business has to go into this thinking they're going to make a profit. And I really scold people who don't pay themselves. Uh, if you don't have a good enough business model to pay yourself when you're starting off in a business, then I don't think it's a real solid business. And uh, I, I won't pick on women, but I will say this, that I've met more women than men in some of my leadership programs and training or uh, in organizations where they would vastly underpay themselves as entrepreneurs or not pay themselves at all. And they said, well, I just started this business and I'm not taking a salary. I'm paying these people, but I'm not doing it. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? You are a value. You have to value, value yourself. And so when you set up your business model, put your salary in there right up front because you've got to be motivated to keep this puppy going. And, um, and you know, I was always motivated by making money. I, I grew up kind of strapped for money. My father died, as I said, when I was 13. And uh, I, had, I started working when I was 13, basically, because I needed to make money. And so that's always been a big motivator to me was a bottom line profit in whatever I was doing. So, and it still does today. You know, um, even in my art business, it's a profitable business. And, uh, and I look at things that way, but it's healthy. You know, it's healthy. Even a nonprofit has to make money to survive. And, uh, you know, it can zero out at the end of the year. But if you're not making any money or getting donations or coming up with ways to increase your cash flow, you're, you're out. So it's a very important thing to understand that and get your head around that. So speaking of knowing the money, how did you fund T3 through the good times and bad for over 30 years? It was totally bootstrapped. And can you all believe that? I look back on that now and that's the most remarkable thing that I can even talk about today. Unbelievable. Because we did go through bad uh, plenty of times. Um, fortunately, like I said, I started off, I had three accounts and we just kind of built on those and I knew how to make a profit. I knew how to deliver great work to keep clients and all that. In a recession, in bad times, I don't care what you're doing right you're going to lose business and take it from me uh, being in the marketing and advertising field a lot of times in a recession those dollars are the first ones to get cut from a company budget because it's nice but not necessary uh, you don't have to run that ad or you don't have to do this you can just do it another way you're just protecting your operations so we had a lot of tough times um, what i did was make very quick decisions on how to stop the bleeding um, and that was not always pleasant. In fact, it was very painful sometimes. And quick decisions were things like, okay, we're gonna have to cut our overhead. What are we gonna do? Uh, we had such a deep recession, that 2008, nine thing, that I had to go down to every line item uh, in our P&L and look for things to cut. 
and I'm going to tell you a funny little story. Um, we used to have this thing called Candy Fridays, and this is before the health craze where people <laughs> didn't think you should feed your employees candy all the time but uh, we had this funny little tradition called candy friday and every friday morning at 10 o'clock the bells would ring and we put these big bowls of candy out and everybody would run downstairs or run from wherever their office was and start grabbing candy and it was just a fun thing it was kind of a tradition and they grab too many bar candy bars but they off they'd go to their their desk but they talk for a few minutes and exchange uh, ideas and what they were going to do that week weekend and uh, it just became a tradition so I started looking during that recession and I said, good grief. I was talking to my CFO and I said, look how much money we're spending on candy every year for our different offices. I said, let's cut that out and I can save a job. And so the next Friday, there was no candy that came out and no bells blew and no one ran down at 10 a.m. And listen, everybody, you would have thought I had shot a dog in the front yard of the building. People were outraged because I had tripped on a cultural landmine. I had just didn't realize how much it meant to people. And when you're cutting staff and when you're cutting things, taking away some of those cultural backbone things that you do is the worst thing you can do. So you got to pay attention to the line items that you cut out that really embody the culture and that give people that sense of belonging and being and tradition. So be careful of those things. But I will say this, the two ways we survive. I am a new business person and I beat myself up. I called everybody I knew. I would hit the road. I did everything I could to sell our teams and pitch new business and come up with new ideas to talk to clients about. So I worked really hard on the new business pipeline when we lost business or when there was recession. And on the other hand, the ugly part was I was very quick, very, very quick to make overhead cuts. And that meant cutting staff because that was the only way we could really save money. We didn't have a, a lot of heavy equipment or those kinds of things. So our overhead was pretty much surrounded with uh, my biggest cost was employees. And so we just had to make the tough calls, but we did it fast and we stopped the bleeding fast so that we were able to survive and every year every year we made a profit when I was there uh, and it's unbelievable to me now that it was totally bootstrapped we never borrowed any money to do it so when there was a recession or a downtime I didn't draw on the line of credit I had one but I did never want to draw on it because when you do then you're beholden to the bank <laughs> and they want to have a little say in how you do things and I didn't really want their control so I would just run from a line of credit now I'm not saying you should do this in some businesses it's you, you're um, you know it's capital intensive and you need to borrow money and you need to have a line of credit and you need to do those things but Fortunately, I didn't have to, so I didn't. And it ultimately gave me much more control over how to run the business day to day and what clients we could take and which ones we didn't. So um, I'm very amazed almost that we were able to do that for all those years. Terrific. Um, you've touched on some of this, but we have a question from Ekaterina and she asks, is there anything you would have done differently to get to where you are today? And would you recommend that you start your company right out of college? Again, it really is the timing. Uh, every person has to examine whether or not they're ready to do what they need to do. And you have to look in the marketplace. And if your idea or concept is really meeting a felt need, or there's a hole in the market and you can run in there, there's never the wrong time to do that. Um, had I, you know, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit and I didn't realize this. You won't believe this, but I didn't realize this until I was about five years into T3 and someone asked me about, well, why did you become an entrepreneur? And I realized that every person in my family, every one of them in my immediate family and as far back as we could trace was an entrepreneur. And that even goes back to the farmers and, and, and ranchers that go way back before my parents and grandparents, but they were all had businesses. And so I had grown up watching people run their own companies. Even my mother had her own kindergarten. My dad had an engineering firm and then back beyond them and all that. So somewhere in my DNA was the entrepreneur spirit. And I felt like I had been entrepreneurial in the companies I had worked with. 
uh, I'd always come up with new thinking, new ways to do things, new ideas, new ways, new profit streams and all that stuff. That's entrepreneurial. And so I had been practicing to be an entrepreneur all those years before 1989. Um, so I don't tell anyone it's a right or wrong time to do something. Uh, you've got to just go for it. And I'll say this, if you fail, that doesn't mean you're not a, go a good entrepreneur. It means you got to learn and you got to fail fast though that's what when I said about quick decisions if things aren't working make those corrections and fail fast because you don't want to just keep as my grandmother said pounding sand into a rat hole if it's not working it ain't working and so make those corrections quickly move on or, or stop it and then reset so be aware of that however uh, for me, it was better to wait until I did because I was pretty young as it was. I was 33 years old when I started my company. And, um, you know, that's pretty young. But yes, I've seen people right out of college do amazing things. And um, so don't stop yourself. If you're ready, you've got the idea, you have the backing, you have a customer base that you can line up, uh, immediate cash flow coming in, then go for it. Just absolutely go for it because it's... Um, it's in your DNA, probably, if you're an entrepreneur and, and you'll love it. It's very gratifying. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Nicole, and she asks if there are any books um, that you recommend about entrepreneurship, um, besides your own, of course. <laughs> oh, yes, you must read mine. It's, it's, it's the holy grail. Um, you know, there's a lot of things out there. Um, I I like, I don't read so much about, or I never did about the entrepreneur. I kind of made my own pathway, but there's a, there's a, there's a book that came out a few years ago. that's really pretty interesting. And it's, and I'm doing some work. I told you all about a little thing called the adjacent possible. And I think it's really great because I, I like to study innovation. I think that is what really differentiates our companies and people pay a lot of lip service to innovation, but there was um, a book that came out a few years ago by uh, Stephen Johnson and it's called Where Good Ideas Come From. And if you're an entrepreneur, you're always looking for good ideas. And so I would recommend kind of diving into that and, and looking at how you're going to be an innovative company or how innovation is going to drive what you do now more than ever. We're looking for that. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I get excited about is, you know, how do we drive true innovation. And one of the things I talked about is diversity of thought, and that really drives innovation. But you also have to create environments that uh, really allow you to do that. Um, again, there's a lot of good books out there. I mean, you can search and look for all kinds of things. Um, but I, I, was, I never read a lot about entrepreneurs. I just kind of was living it. Um, and um, I always looked at more of a articles or programs or people that I thought were pretty cool who were offering ideas on how to innovate. We used to do um, a little program at T3 where uh, people would pick TED Talks to show and we would go have early breakfast and watch a TED Talk and then discuss those because a lot of times, even though those were things completely different from what we were doing, they were people who were talking about innovating uh, and how to create something out of something else. And, uh, and those are the things that I, I get excited about as a business person and as an entrepreneur. I also think Harvard Business Review is pretty good, you know, uh, Brand X, because I'm a UT grad, but, uh, but uh, it's, there's some really good articles that I, I would look to in that. And that, that a lot of time would help me uh, craft some thinking or some ideas. The other thing for me that was really important as an entrepreneur was studying our client's business. So I would, I would listen to the earnings reports. Uh, I, would, I would watch their quarterly reviews and I would look at their annual reports and really tune in to the stock market and what was going on because most of the companies we worked with were publicly traded. So their information was readily available. And I always encouraged our teams to really, really get your head around that. Uh, study these companies and what's working and what's not. And you get a whole lot of lessons in that on how to run your own business because um, the failures you see are, are the wins or those companies that took advantage of uh, an opportunity during sometimes things like this. You know, look at the companies that are thriving right now. You know, they're, they're being innovative and taking advantage when everybody's digging, they're zagging. So um, study these companies that work, study the companies that are successful. Um, and that to me is a good way to, to learn. Great. 
So as a female entrepreneur, do you feel like you've had the same opportunities available to you as to others? Well, if you want to compare it to other females, certainly. <laughs> uh, but with men, you know, I, I tell people I'm still the only woman in the room in a lot of meetings and a lot of things I'm involved in. Uh, but a long time ago, I just kind of put that aside and, and uh, I'm sure uh, and I know for a fact that, and I used to blame it on the fact, not blame it, but say that, well, the reason maybe we didn't win that piece of business was because we were too small uh, or we didn't had, couldn't scale the business or we were competing against the big guys. And so, you know, that was one of the factors. But I also have to believe that, you know, there are probably some people who weren't willing to take a risk on a female own business. They had seen others fail. And one of the things that helped to set us apart from other female run businesses is that when clients ask me, can you scale the business? And that means, will you grow with us if we give you business? We would always step up and say yes. And once again, let me look back to the Dell relationship that taught me we could do this. And Dell was growing like crazy all the years we worked with them. And so they kept giving me more business and more business. And we just kept meeting the challenge. We added great staff. We would add technology. We added office space. We did whatever it took to scale the business with them and grow with them. And so I had that tangible example right there. And so when a Chase Bank or when Allstate asked me that exact question, if we give you business, can you scale with us? I could say, absolutely, I can scale with you. And so that's what set us apart. And once clients understood that and they saw the results we got, it didn't really matter you know, if it was a male or female um, company, they were looking for results and they were looking for someone who uh, they could rely on. And uh, I was I was there with them, you know, and I had really good relationships uh, with our clients and they knew they could count on me. And that's the bottom line. You know, they've got to believe in you and you've got to but you got to perform. You know, and if we performed and helped our clients grow their business and helped our clients get promoted and all the things that, that they're trying to do, then you have a winning combination regardless if you're a male or female. Great. So we have one last question as we're ending our time here. Um, what are you planning to learn next or are you satisfied right now? Oh, I'm never satisfied. <laughs> Life is a lot, lifelong learning is what we all do. And uh, so I'm kind of studying some new things that I'm excited about um, around life planning and kind of what's next for people and as we kind of reset our, our lives. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about right now. Um, and also just kind of growing some of the enterprises that I'm involved in. Uh, I'm working on boards. I've got some interesting projects I'm doing there. So no, satisfaction is, you know, I can be certainly satisfied in some things. I'm not a malcontent, I won't say that. But, you know, being a little dissatisfied is part of the entrepreneur spirit. Because if you set back on your laurels too long, then life becomes a little boring. And uh, the, the thing I fear most is boredom. And so uh, most entrepreneurs feel that way. Uh, you're just scared to death that you're going to be bored someday. So you keep getting into things to keep life interesting. Great. Well, Gay, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you also, Stephanie and Elizabeth, and for our uh, marketing and partnership teams who are helping behind the scenes. And a big thank you to everybody who is here today on the call. So um, Gay has all her information here in case um, you need to follow up or join the newsletter. Um, and we just want to say thank you again with hopes for good health and peace to all of us. And we hope that we've helped you here with our commitment to hone your skills and help you lead in a world that needs us all. So thanks again. Thanks to all of you. Appreciate your attention.